Yeah, so welcome back, uh, everyone. Um, I'm just reading from First Peter chapter one, and um, this is verses uh, verse twenty two onwards, right? First Peter chapter one, verse twenty two. It says, "Since you have obeyed, sorry, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again." not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the field. The grass withers, and it flower falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now, this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Okay, so we... Um, just see a few things um, that Peter mentions here. He says, you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. So we're looking at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22 onwards, 22 to 25, right? So you have purified your souls. What, what purifies our souls, um, which means our thinking, our imagination, when we obey the truth, when we actually carry out the instruction of God's word. Okay. Then the second thing that we see is that, um, you know, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, corruptible through the word of God. So you born again, not of something that's corruptible, but something that's incorruptible, corruptible meaning, um, you know, incorruptible meaning something that does not decay, something, something that is not capable of, um, you know, going bad, right? Uh, it's incorruptible, it's pure. So. Uh, you, since because it's pure, your you know your the word of God. Since it's pure, you have is, and since you obeyed the word, you purified your souls, your mind, will, emotions, intellect. Everything is being purified. Your attitudes, um, your motive, everything is being purified. Then it says here, you've been born again, not of corruptible, but of incorruptible, which is the word of God, of incorruptible seed, which is the word of God. Um, and then it says that. Uh, you know, the flesh is as grass, the glory of man as a flower of the fields, and then everything, you know, the grass withers, it just, everything is, uh, it's so um, temporary, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And it goes on, stays on, because it's not of the world, it's something that's heavenly, something spiritual, and the word of the Lord um, goes on forever. And in chapter 2, it says, therefore, Lay aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So he's saying, you know, he's just describing the word, you know, you purify your souls through obeying the word of God. Um, you will, you know, you, the word of God is so pure and it's incorruptible and it's like seed. And because of that, you were born again. And, uh, you know, everything else that you see, the grass and the, uh, everything is uh, very uh, temporary. It's transient. But then you see that the word of God endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you, which by the gospel was preached to you. you know, this word, which is uh, living and powerful and alive. Uh, this is the word which has been uh, preached to you. And it says, therefore, lay aside. You know, put aside all malice, all envy, all hypocrisy, everything, all deceit. And as newborn babes, desire, desire this pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So, you know, he's talking about the word of God. He's talking about the characters of the word of God. And he's talking about what happens when you, when the word of God is, you know, in us as a seed. What happens when the word of God is obeyed and what happens when, and we desire the pure milk of the word of God, um, and we grow, and there is spiritual growth. So, um, you know, just before getting into the, you know, into the notes, is saying that the word of God is so central to to our lives as believers, you know, and as communicators, as facilitators, as preachers, um, we have this privilege of handling this powerful, this awesome uh, word of God, right? Which is uh, and not of this world, which is uh, the truth of it 
is uh, you know it's 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 from the heavens and it's from God originates from him and he speaks it and therefore it has uh, life it has uh, intrinsic power and we get to handle it we get to communicate it we get to preach it right it's an awesome privilege right and the, and the importance of um, uh, of the preaching uh, being you know uh, central or the word of god being central to our preaching okay so last uh, last session we ended by looking at um, you know this whole aspect practical aspect of communication right um, while we handle this amazing word of god um, what can we do practically to make sure that when we communicate it reaches the one who is the recipient of this communication it reaches in the same manner you know it's not lost in transit it's not um, you know damaged in transit uh, it reaches the same way uh, you know uh, for the most part it reaches the same way in which it was meant to reach okay so the message does not change it does not adulterate it the message does not uh, you know lose any of it uh, any of it, what was supposed to be um, and supposed to be communicated and it reaches in the same way therefore you know finding its mark therefore um, you know uh, uh, the seed being sown in, on good ground okay so we looked at several things the basics of communication we looked at what communication does and so on we um, so i think we we came to point number 7 and we saw you know we it's important that we understand um people are the audience we understand their life orientation where they are at so that we can communicate even better right we can choose illustrations we can choose uh, the method of communication um communicating that same message you know it's the, the uh, but we can choose different ways of communicating it you know and if you are communicating to a very if you're preaching, if you're sharing with a very, very young audience, let's say these are children, then obviously um, the best way to communicate is through, you know, object lessons maybe, is through, uh, you know, some other way, something visual, something uh, like object lessons, something that you do and show so that it stays with them. Right? It, it completely, they're able to retain it, it, it stays with them, right? Uh, so children, uh, well, at that age, um, their mind is able to see things and grasp things. They may not be able to think abstractly right? uh, at that stage yet, you know, abstractly in terms of theories and all those things, uh, putting things together, uh, ideas, maybe not, maybe not at that stage. So it's best to think of communicating with you know object lessons and something visual you know you use pictures you use videos you use charts and uh, and they're able to grasp it so it's good to understand what you know is my who is my audience and uh, um, and what are what stage of life are they in what phase season of life are they in right okay so the other one next one uh, uh, continuing with basics of communication is that um we when we communicate, we communicate, you know, when we are, when, let's say so if it's spoken communication, we communicate in a verbal manner. And as we are communicating in verbal, in a verbal manner, we also, um, we also communicate, communicate in non-verbal ways. Okay, there are, now, what do we mean by that? Which means that we use gestures. Uh, you know, quite recently I watched a video where it says you know italians uh can italians speak without uh, without using their hands you know uh, well it showed it showed clips of different people in italy and they are talking to each other and they're always using their hands you know um, so that's one thing they you know they, it's that they use these gestures and they talk like this and so it's uh, normally you know refers to Ital italians right they they use these a lot so um so they showed all these clips and said, you know, can Italians speak without using their hands? Well, the obvious thing was no, there's a lot of gestures. So the thing is that even when we speak, we use hand gestures, we use you know, our face, um, we use the tone of voice. There are a lot of non-verbal, of course, tone would be a verbal thing, but 
use gestures. We use um, you know the way we look at our, our audience, or not looking at them, not connecting with them. You know all those things are uh, clues. You know the way we stand, the way we move about. All those are verbal verbal cues um, that or uh, verbal messages that the audience is also picking up. And uh, and certain things that we may not even realize, but it shuts, you know, um, uh, the audience will find it difficult, you know, may, maybe even shut down our message. You know, let's say, for example, we, well, we we don't smile at all, you know, with our audience. We we wish them, and it's, we've got a very long face. We're very serious. Um, well, the audience might find it difficult to relate, right? Um, Especially if the message is not so serious, if it's not uh, you know absolutely uh, you know of, of that nature, so, you know you're not talking about crucifixion or you know anything of that sort, but you're talking about something uh, which is which is light-hearted. But uh, and if you're going to have a very serious expression now, that's a that's a non-verbal message that's going out. So be mindful of that. Okay, if we are fidgeting, all always fidgeting and fidgeting in the sense, you know, and just maybe just you know doing that, and uh, uh, and you know you're always adjusting your collar or putting something in the pen, taking it in your pocket, taking it out. Um, these are things that distract, right? So we need to be mindful of that. Okay, so we, we when we communicate, there are verbal things, and we're going to come back to it a little later. When we're making presentations, you know, how can we have an impactful presentation, and uh, what are some things to avoid doing, right? Okay, when we, uh, one of the things that we need to understand is that um, communication. Uh, let me just share this uh, notes here. Okay. Okay, that's coming up. Okay, that's it. So we we need to understand that um, when we communicate, so there's a reaction, okay, and uh, it it stirs up, it produces some uh, emotion in people, um, the words that we use, the things that we narrate, right? So we need to be aware of that, right? The message that you share it evokes a reaction um, cognitive meaning you know it just uh, because they understand the reason they receive it and it's going to produce a reaction right for example if there's something that you know something humorous that you're narrating then well they receive it then there is a reaction to it response to it right uh, and the response is normally laughter or at least a smile if it's not a great joke right so you so it's a communication you're communicating something therefore you know you could communicate something to to diffuse a situation meaning that uh, uh, maybe uh, people are angry upset and you're sharing something to calm them calm calm them down well that's a real that's a response that's a reaction that you expect you know, that is possible if people are discouraged uh, well you're sharing something encouraging something positive and something uh, you know prophetic and uh, an in time in season word that builds them up right so so be aware of that that your communication is going to evoke a, a reaction right because you're handling the truth, um, you know. Generally, communication evokes, evokes a reaction, but especially since you're handling the truth and you're sharing the truth, and maybe a timely word, it's going to evoke a reaction. At the same time, just to just to you know be mindful of the fact that you don't want to use communication uh, to manipulate an emotion. Like you, you don't you don't want to share something just to make people. Either feel good about you know themselves, or you know you want to elicit some sympathy, or you want to feel liked by people, right? So you can do a lot of things, right, um, to manipulate emotion, and we are we are we have to avoid that, right? Uh, because um, you know we're not here to do that, right? We uh, we need to be communicators. With integrity, so you don't share things just to make people feel 
uh, something emotional or you know so you want them to you know um, uh, act in a certain way you know we don't want to do that right we don't want to stir up uh, people's emotions we want to present the truth and yes there, there will be an emotional reaction as a result of that there could be well that's that's absolutely fine but we do not want to manipulate the emotions of people, you know, man or manipulate the actions of people, you know, in order to, let's say, uh, you know, we sometimes we hear so many things happening, you know, we uh, uh, manipulating people's emotions in order to give for a good cause and present the truth, share the truth. Well, the truth itself could move people, you know, maybe it's a it's a very worthy cause, maybe that's a need, and it's a, you know, uh, well, people are living in some very difficult situations and conditions and you know it moves the hearts of people obviously there will be a reaction uh, and you know but you don't do that with the intent of just manipulating em emotions so that people will give right it's a fine line but we need to be aware of that okay so here are certain things you know what are the functions of language itself right when you when you see um language um well, it could come under these categories. We could look at that. Uh, well, we can inform, right? We report information, like much like how a news reader would, right? You inform, okay? You're informing that this happened, that happened. So it's historical facts, uh, current events. You, know, you could use language to inform, right? Um, you could use a language to interrogate. In the sense, you're eliciting information, you're asking questions, you're investigating. Uh, you you could use language for that, right? you in in order to be interreg. It can be interrogative in nature. It can be informative. It can be interrogative. It can be directive, meaning you can give instructions, you can give orders, you can give commands um, for you know getting certain things done, or things to be done in a certain way, etc. So it can be directive, right? It is expressive. In the sense, you can express your emotions through the language that you use, and the audience can see it. Right? It is expressive. Right? You, so, what is in your heart, what is in your mind, um, you can express it. You can bring it out so that others can see it, and it's done through language. You can be given to our feelings, our emotions, and it's done through language. It's also evocative, you know, like just what we saw just now that it's it creates emotions in people. So it is evocative as well. Okay, so we see that these are some of the functions of language. It uh, it is used to inform. It is used to you know find information, get information. Interrogative in nature. It's directive. It's expressive and evocative. Okay, just for us to understand that language can be used in all these ways, even as we communicate. Okay. So when we look into the Word of God, when we look into the Bible, we see that there is, you know, is there homiletics in the in the Bible? Like this whole thing of preparing, speaking, preparing, preaching, um, you know, this uh, 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 putting together a message and sharing. Is there, you know, uh, homiletics in the Bible? Well, when we look at uh, prophetic writings, we see that. When we look at the language that was used, um, when we look at, you know, like we, we see Proverbs, we see, um, uh, for example, let me just read out uh, uh, a portion where there is a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of, let, let's say, I, I'm just, I just opened up to Psalm 107, okay? So we see that there is a lot of repetitions, uh, the lot of, uh, you know, so we see this happening there. And of course, I'm just reading through this passage, um, and not exactly it's not exactly a sermon, but we see this, right? You see, oh, uh, Psalm 107, oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Okay. Then as we go down, you see that there's a repetition. Oh, that man, men would give thanks um, uh, to the Lord. And men would give thanks to the lord for his goodness so we see that repeated um, uh, that verse is repeated that's a refrain which comes over and over again uh, oh that men would give thanks to the lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men you see that in verse 8 
you see that in verse 15 you see that in verse 21 you see that it's a it's a refrain of course it's a song so you see that it's a you know the psalms they are songs right songs of praise songs of worship so you see that refrain coming through and also verse 8 you know then they cried to the lord in their trouble and he delivered them out of their distresses verse 13 then they cried to the lord in their trouble and he delivered and he saved them out of the distresses um verse 19 also um you know so we see that um you know this off repeated lines coming through you see that there's a you know, there's some intention there's some well the the, the thought the inspiration is uh is uh you know the, the is the truth they've been moved by that but then they've also used these metaphors they use these refrains in order to communicate the message and also when we when we look at um the prophetic uh when you look at some of the prophets when you look at uh, um the way in which they spoke and the way in which they communicated the message there's, you see that they are they use these um you know figures of speech they use these uh, metaphors and illustrations and so on okay wisdom literature meaning proverbs ecclesiastes again we see that um, you know uh, ecclesiastes uh, solomon uh, referred to as the preacher and um, you know some of the things that he he speaks and he says uh, which is recorded there uh, uh, you know well, well powerful word pictures are there and especially in Proverbs 25, we see that, um, you know, it says uh, a, a word that is spoken in uh, at the right time, okay, and the right circumstances, right? it's like apples of gold in settings of silver, right? Uh, it's like, a, you know, amazing picture, word picture that we see here, you know, apples of gold, gold apples, golden apples in, you know, in a silver setting. So we see that. Right. And the and the Lord Jesus, okay, when he when he spoke, when he taught, when he preached, okay, we see that um, he uses metaphors. You know, we saw one like last session. We saw that the Lord Jesus saying, you know, why do you look at the speck in another person's eye and you forget the log in your own eye? And he used um, hyperbole, right? And um, he used parables. Uh, when he was preaching, he, was, he, uses, he uses many parables uh, to talk about the kingdom, to talk about, um, you know, the word of God uh, and uh, to talk about, um, you know, ourselves, our own identity as salt and light. He uses a lot of parables um, to bring home the truth of, uh, of, of the gospel, the truth of God's kingdom. He uses many parables. So we see that, you know, the, uh, there is, well, if you can say homiletics, is it there in the Bible? We see that, right? Um, some sermons to look at are, you know, uh, Stephen, just before him being martyred in Acts chapter 7. Okay, we see a sermon, like it's, uh, it seems like an impromptu sermon, but it's like we know that uh, Stephen is used to, preaching you know how do we do that how do you know that you know just go to Acts chapter um yeah let's go to Acts 5 Acts 6 sorry so Acts 6 right we see um when they were chosen the the seven we see Stephen a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit and Philip uh, and and so on, and it says here that uh, they were. Th this was a qualification, right? Good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and they were appointed over this task. And it says that um, you know, in verse seven, you go down. It says then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Of course, this was because of the ministry of the apostles and the ministry of these um, these seven who were. Uh, you know, uh, like Stephen, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Taman, Parmenas, and Nicholas. And Nicholas was a proselyte, meaning that he was a traveling, uh, you know, a preacher, right? So, uh, um, and also it says that um, Stephen, full of faith and power, was eight. Okay, chapter six, verse eight. Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. 
and we know that you know they wherever they went they preached and and, the, and god was faithful to um uh, faithful to accomplish the word which was priest which was spoken so so we see that right so when we come to acts chapter 7 and we we see stephen addressing right stephen is a very give, giving a very um categorical um you know an address of um starts with uh, starts with abraham right so the high priest just asks this question in verse one are these things so okay seven chapter one um sorry chapter seven verse one and then you know stephen starts off he starts off with a message uh right from abraham he talks about the uh, talks about Joseph, uh, talks about the Exodus, talks about Moses, um, and um, yeah, just goes on, right? Um, so we see that is a very uh, well. We could say that it's it was it is in him, right? But he was used to sharing. He was used to preaching uh, the gospel because he it says the testimony is that he did great signs and wonders among the people. Right? We see then. Um, then again, when we back up to Acts chapter two, you know we see a sermon that Peter he delivers. He's just anointed, filled, baptized by the Holy Spirit, and he and he shares. Right? And Paul um, at um, you know Mars Hill, right in Athens, and uh, how he uh, shares uh, about shares the gospel. Acts chapter seventeen, right. So, well. Uh, it is said of Paul that he did not, uh, because Paul says, you know, very clearly that, uh, you know, he he did not really, he was not trained in speech, meaning that he was not trained to be the um, eloquent uh, orators of his time. Uh, so the orators of the, uh, of his time, they would, they were, they were trained to speak in a certain way. They were trained to use some, you know, flowery, uh, you know, very um, uh, high language um, and words uh, in order to communicate something, right? In order to get the attention of people, they are, they are used to using these quotes from famous uh, people and uh, and all that. Uh, so Paul was not actually trained in that. He says in one Corinthians one, uh, he he very plainly says, you know, one Corinthians one seventeen and also chapter two verse one. Maybe we can just read that out. Um, let me just. Uh, yeah, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 17, he says, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no, no effect. And then chapter 2, verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God, but I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Verse 4, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. So, um, well, in all his uh, in all his messages, we see that where he he was well read and he spoke, um, you know, in, in a very orderly manner. Uh, though he says he himself says that he was not trained in these uh, oratorical ways, right, of his time. Okay, so we see that. Um, we see you know homiletics in in the new testament we see that in the old testament we see that in the writings um well when when we look at um, paul's instruction to timothy right paul says uh, he encourages timothy to to give himself to the you know to the preaching of the word give himself to the um to doctrine to rightly dividing the word of god so the importance that uh, timothy needs to give okay uh, let's look at uh, first timothy chapter 3 and verse 2 okay first timothy chapter 3 and uh, verse 2 okay uh, so there in verse 2 he says uh, a bishop which means uh, a spiritual overseer must be able must have the ability to teach which means must have the ability to you know we can we can say okay teach preach like communicate uh, proclaim Okay, the word. We go down to chapter four, and we we look at verse thirteen, right? So he says, "Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine." 
okay to reading to stay in the word uh, so they have the the old testament the scrolls and you know paul's revelations that he was writing and so all that was there and so he's saying uh, give it give attention to reading to exhortation to doctrine um do not neglect the gift which is in you and then uh, again in verse 16 he says take heed to yourself and to the doctrine continue in them okay so continue meaning the the first instruction is that okay you uh, meditate give yourself entirely um to that is in verse 15 but it says you know give attention to reading to exhortation to doctrine so exhortation meaning you you know you based on what you've read you are actually encouraging right uh, you're giving an encouraging word an inspiring word that's an exhortation right um so 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 paul is uh, giving that so which means that uh, that was part of the early church as well that there was exhortation uh, there was uh, preaching right so that we see just uh, based on the word of god okay so we and several other scriptures mentioned here you can take a look at it okay so um so we come to this uh, I'm just moving on to chapter 3 okay uh, just give me a minute let me just check here okay so chapter 3 okay so we, so we see that um, in today's world okay where there's uh, there's different ways by which we communicate any message um this communication is so rapid okay and rampant and uh, with with technology uh, changing and being there's so much of innovation uh, so messages are you know being communicated in very different ways so is preaching still relevant right so that's a question right um is it relevant or should we just um uh, you know is it outdated okay is it relevant should it be spoken out loud should it be um you know when you look at it if you look at all the ways in which the message is going out electronically you know um written communication and so on we see that um well in one way if you see some of these videos or most of these videos are also videos of you know there's somebody who's who's there's, there's a speech there is speech there is visual right uh, in the videos it could be a long lengthy one it could be a it could be a live thing but there is there is speech and there is text and there is visual right so uh, that happens okay um so john stott uh, a theologian uh, a writer you know, this is what he says uh, preaching is indispensable to christianity without preaching a necessary part of its authenticity has been lost christianity in is in its very essence a religion of the word of god just consider that the word there can be many things that you can do with the word write the word you can you know sing the word uh, you communicate the word the word right it's spoken as well right so uh, when it comes to communicating okay so let's look at some of these thoughts here okay it's an over communicated society okay you have uh, you have instagram you have facebook you have youtube you have uh, you know all these things social media linkedin and all those messaging boards and uh, twitter and all that it yes um it is an over communicated you know add to that newspapers and billboards and and all that that's happening you know it's, it's a lot of communication there's a lot of noise a lot of uh, um, literally you know everything is um, shouting out trying to get your attention saying okay um, you know follow this buy this uh, go here go there all kinds of messages you know buy me use me buy me again you know live here so it is really an over communicated society that we live in okay and within that is it relevant to preach the word of god you know, in a setting okay so so one thing we need to understand is all these 
you know, all these methods of communication, you know, these billboards and, and maybe all these videos and everything can certainly, you know, this, this it's, it's, it is good in a way. It can enhance our communication, okay? It can definitely enhance our communication, but uh, we should be careful that they don't substitute the, the message, okay? So, which means they don't dilute, they don't substitute, Substitute meaning you replace with something else, right? Dilute meaning you you water down uh, and change the, uh, distort the message, you know, the seriousness of it or the weightage of it or the, the wholesomeness of it is, you know, you take away parts of it so it, that it, it is watered down, it's diluted, right? The strength of it is taken away. Um, so all these, uh, technology techniques can enhance our communication of the message but uh, they they can be in the danger of substituting if we allow it right so we need to we need to make sure that does not happen okay um, well we also live in a society where first of all you know it is over communicated we also live in a society where social action okay appeals to the to the some Christians more than maybe you know communicating the truth or listening. Okay. Like what is the question? You know, they some some of the things that they put forth is that okay, what good are words of faith? Okay. When society demands works of faith, you know, there is a demand for action. So what good are these words? Okay. So you know they even say, okay, these apostles but the, that verse in the, I mean, that verse that we read just now, Acts chapter six. Uh, why were the, the seven actually, um, you know, selected and and uh, and you know ordained for the task? Because the apostle said we should not, you know, move away from the preaching. We should not move away from the study of God's word. Okay, but when it comes to you know people who are uh, who say that okay, we need more action than you know we need social action. Um, well. They, they seem to think otherwise, right? So, so that is uh, that is not, that's a real challenge. Okay, so it's an overcommunicated society. There's a challenge uh, in in the audience itself, which says, okay, uh, I don't want the words. I I want the action. Okay, but we need to understand that action is important, but it should come from it should come from truth. It should be um, action, which is which is inspired, which is motivated, which is moved out of truth and truth that is actually communicated. Okay. So, um, so the thing is, uh, you know, we see all these challenges uh, and, um, okay. Paul, when he writes to the, to the Romans, to the, um, you know, this is something that he says, right? I think it's, it's good to read through this. Okay. Um, Yeah, so we see here that Paul, when he writes to uh, the Romans, Romans chapter one, he says, I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Okay, so what is it? So he's saying that uh, he, he was writing to them. He had, uh, you know, uh, encourage them. He's saying, you know, I long to see you that I might in person uh, pray, prophesy, maybe lay hands. He's saying, I want to impart some spiritual gift. So in other words, he's saying that you know, this ministry of impartation, this ministry of, uh, you know, uh, this this whole thing of ministering, you know, it's, it's going to take place face to face. Um, and there can be no other substitutes. You know, he says, uh, uh, verse 15, Okay, let's uh, maybe look at those verses. Um, you can turn to Romans 1. Okay. Um, so in verse 15, he says, um, So as much as is, as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Right? So he says, So the importance of uh, actually communicating um uh, uh, uh preaching the gospel so we see that it is 
it was relevant then and uh, the same thing is relevant today right um, the whole aspect of ministering the whole aspect of impartation um, the whole thing of laying on of hands and so on so it's we cannot do away with it we cannot substitute it with anything else right but it's it's definitely it is good when we use technology it is good when we use all these methods um, and you know and so i think every ministry and every church should definitely you know use um, all these means in order to, um, to in order for maximum impact and maximum mileage and so on but we, we know that locally in that place um, you know there needs to be this whole thing of in person or face to face uh, maybe it's a small group maybe it's a church maybe it's a fellowship you know where god can or god can do what he wants done um, through you know this community of people gathering together meeting together okay um okay right so um so let's uh you know it, it, just look at a few things you know why is it relevant okay so we see that god is uh, a god who speaks he's is alive he's living he speaks he speaks in the here and now um uh, hebrews talks about the fact that he spoke through his prophets and he's in these last days he's speaking through his son and then now we know that you know he's speaking through us the, the body of christ when where the you know we the church we are the expression of the body of christ the expression of the body of christ so which means that uh, expression of christ himself so when we look at each one of us as believers, you know, a, as a community together, we are the expression of Christ, the ministry of Christ in a certain place, okay, uh, which would be, you know, taking care of people's needs. It could be bringing healing, wholeness. It is bringing salvation, the message of the gospel, everything. So the church is expression. You know, to express, it means in different ways, right? In action. Also, it means to communicate, right? To show forth, to put on display, right? Um, so we are the expression of uh, Christ in a certain geographical location, okay? But God commissioned the prophets to proclaim. So we see that it's scriptural today to proclaim um, the Lord Jesus. He went about preaching and teaching, and we, as his disciples, are to walk in his footsteps. So, therefore, you know, we will also walk uh, in his ways and minister according to uh, the way he ministered in truth and with power. Right? Mark chapter one and verse fourteen says. Uh, now, after John had been put in the gospel, uh, had been put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, "The time is fulfilled; the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel." See that in verse uh, fourteen and fifteen. So he preached the gospel of the kingdom, and he said, "Repent and believe in the gospel." So we see in several places that he preached, that he taught, and he went about healing you know we see that over and over and over again this is how he did he preached the gospel he taught in the synagogues and he healed all who came to him so that was his earthly ministry like he proclaimed the truth he taught the truth and he um, ministered in power the truth uh, uh, which which set things right in people's bodies which uh, resulted in deliverance and so on okay then um, john the baptist came preaching the he was a forerunner the apostles preached the gospel in Jerusalem, Judea, and Judea, and Samaria. And um, as people filled by the Holy Spirit, we are called to be witnesses, right? We are called to witness. We see in Acts chapter 1. Okay, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This is what the Lord said about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And uh, for, all the, uh, for all the disciples, he said... Uh, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me. Uh, and he went on to say, okay, this is the scope of witnessing. Okay, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So you shall be witnesses in all these places, and you should be filled with power 
and how did the people go about doing that you know they preached the gospel they shared the gospel they pointed to christ they testified of what christ had done uh, in their lives and what he could do and uh, we see that happening okay so um we can say that preaching is god's uh, ordained means of sharing the gospel okay so it it need not we cannot we, we need not um, do away with preaching while we you know while we indulge in several other ways of maybe even writing singing it and and discussing it and, and so on so we don't have to or we should not do away the um this method of spreading the gospel which is preaching the gospel so we see several other examples okay um and lastly you know we are commissioned by the lord to preach the gospel Okay, so to communicate the gospel, to proclaim the gospel, you know, we see it in Matthew chapter twenty-eight. We see it in Mark chapter sixteen, uh, verse fifteen, where we are called and commissioned, uh, anointed, empowered by the Lord to go preach the gospel to every creature, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that the Lord has uh, taught us to do. Okay, so we see that uh, in the face of uh, over communicated society in the face of all these things happening all these changes of technical technological advances uh, we don't we should not substitute you know good preaching uh, with anything else right because the lord is uh, looking for uh, people who would communicate the truth and uh, we would we is looking for people who would uh, uh, you know as much as he's looking at for people who would stand in the gap he's looking for people who would communicate the truth and he's looking and he's looking to perform or confirm uh, his word right confirm the preaching of the word uh, with his power with signs wonders and miracles but first of all there has to be the proclamation and the Lord would watch over the word to perform what has been proclaimed, right? So the proclamation is very, very important. Okay, so we'll stop here. Uh, just for us, so we saw you know, today the importance of preaching, the relevance of preaching, and also we just, you know, uh, concluded the basics of communication and the basics of language itself. Okay, so we'll stop here, and next class we'll... Uh, we we'll look at the preacher, you know, the man. We looked at the message, you know, the man. Um, we looked at the method, sorry, and we're going to look at the man, the preacher, you know, uh, the call and the qualifications. Uh, we look at that in the next class, okay, which is on Thursday. Okay. Okay. So thank you, and uh, God bless. We'll meet again. <laughs>